Hello, my name is Sarah Riccardi. I have started my PhD in October and I am doing practice-based research exploring the communication of art history outside of educational settings to non-specialist audiences. I have decided to present a very short example of my practice as I will be talking about a painting in two different ways. The first less and the second more traditional and then briefly comment on both. First example. What is the very first thing that catches your eye in this image? Where do you find your gaze resting? Is it on the crisp white sheet of fabric on the young woman's leg? Is it on her face as she turns towards the left? It looks like a rather sudden turn, doesn't it? Or is it a bit further up, on the face of the older man on the right, with his hand inviting silence? Perhaps you have noticed the stone step where the woman is resting her foot. There is a small chip on its edge on the right and some empty space there. If you feel like stepping in and joining the scene, you have fallen for the artist's trick. That step is there precisely to invite us in. But then, does it look like a situation we want to be involved with? Something feels off. The body of the woman in the foreground, so exposed, contrasts strongly with the rest, with the cold stone bench on which she is sitting and with the two men heavily dressed, covered, protected by their thick capes. Her flesh is soft and pale, while the face of the man silencing her looks coarse and in shadow. Does it feel right to be looking at her body? Why can we look at it? if it seems like she doesn't want to be looked at. Now, try and imagine a 17-year-old girl with a strong passion for painting and a father who is a painter, growing up surrounded by many brothers and her father's friends, many of them artists too. Imagine her not being able to go and study art at the academy because she is a young woman and is not allowed to study from naked male models. Imagine her having her father and his friends as teachers and her own body to paint from. Imagine them telling her that to be a great artist she has to paint great stories and the style of her time, the 17th century, requiring figures to be at least partially naked. Imagine how she might be perhaps feeling exposed against her will but having to carry on because she knows that she is a great artist. She is Artemisia Gentileschi and she painted this image. Second example. This is the first Finnish painting we know by the Baroque artist Artemisia Gentileschi. She was only 17 when she completed it, in 1610, and it clearly shows the level of her artistic talent. Artemisia had been training with her father, Orazio Gentileschi, who was a painter himself. In the 17th century, in fact, it was quite rare for women to be allowed to develop a professional practice in art, and of the relatively few we know today who actually succeeded at it, a significant number came from artistic families. It was much easier, safer, and considered more proper for a young woman who wanted to paint to be educated within her own household. Women were not allowed to attend training in official institutions, such as academies. Attending life drawing classes, studying the human form directly from naked male models, was considered completely unacceptable. But the idealized heroic nude was the foundation of what was known as history painting, painting dealing with stories from history, mythology and the Bible. And in turn, History painting was regarded as the highest form of painting. Women then were faced with a series of obstacles in fulfilling artistic aspirations, as they were effectively denied access to the tools to become high profile artists. In this painting, Gentileschi does not seem willing to compromise on her desire to present herself as a highly skilled professional and she picks the story of Susanna and the Elders, a subject from the Bible. The story is that of a young, beautiful woman who, while bathing, is harassed by two older men, 
who threatened her to tell the rest of the community that she had been sexually promiscuous unless she accepts to be intimate with them. In the painting we see the woman on the very foreground, naked, clearly troubled by the two men coming close. The artist grew up in a male household as her mother died when she was young and it is possible to recognise the influence of her own personal experience in the way the distress of the young Susanna is sensitively represented. It is also likely that Gentileschi was able to represent the naked female body so masterfully because she could study her own. So this is the end of the examples from my practice, so I'm now going to briefly explain. One key point when I create events or talks for the general public on art history is to consider what voice I want to let come through. The second example I presented today, the more traditional one, prioritizes the voice of me as the art historian. My knowledge and some pieces of information that are somehow expected when presenting a painting, such as who the artist is or what the painting represents. The first example instead presented a shift in focus. The goal of the communication there was not primarily the transmission of knowledge and information, but rather facilitating a personal direct engagement with the art. Some information was still shared, but only to improve the engagement experience and not as the final aim. To adopt the viewer voice, as I was doing in asking open questions about what you saw, is one of the possible tools to create a more equal relationship, where I, as the speaker in an event, am not in a position of power, nor are the people participating passive listeners. I have been delivering events on art history for three and a half years now, and I found that there is an element of intuition when it comes to tailoring the delivery to the kind of engagement I want to create. As part of the PhD research though, I am using iterative methodology. I go through the process of identifying a topic about which I want to create an event, researching it and putting the content together, and crucially, defining the voice I want to use to present it. As I do so, I step back from the practice and reflect on what I am doing, how I am doing it and why I make certain choices. The repetition of this process of doing and analysing throughout the course of the PhD will allow me to produce a conceptualization in a scholarly framework of how art history can be communicated in different ways and of why it is important to consciously and actively promote and increase variety and diversification in this field.